Hi everyone. So today we'll continue our third lecture on SML, and this third lecture is on uh, uh, basically higher level uh, functions. So we'll start with reduce, also called fold write. So fold write is a standard operation in functional programming languages. When we want to generalize the notion of recursion over lists as follows, all recursions have a base case, and then we have an iterative case and a way of combining the results from the iterative case from the end back to the beginning. That's why it's called fold right because it actually folds uh, starting from the right hand side. So this reduce operation uh, or fold right basically takes the function that we want to apply to all of the elements, the base case, uh, and then a list. If the list is empty, then the result is just the base case. If the list is not empty, if it has a head and a tail, then we apply the function f on the uh, head of the list h and the result of the reduce operation of the function, the base case and the tail. So you can basically see that uh, you take a list and you start applying the function. The function is supposed to be a function that takes two parameters. And, but actually the result is obtained only at the end. The moment that the list is empty, the result is the base case and that will solve the uh, equation for the second parameter and now from the end both parameters are known and the function starts applying the operation till the beginning okay so for instance let's take as an example how do you use fold right for summing all of the elements in a list so basically summing all the elements of a list uh, a list is just basically a variable that stands for the list, is the reduce operation. And now we pass the three parameters. Basically, the first parameter is the uh, plus operation, is a binary function. The second parameter is the base case. We start with zero for basically the empty list doesn't have any elements, therefore their sum is zero. And then the third parameter is the actual list. So the way that this actually works is that it goes to the end and then assigns zero to the last, to the empty list. And then the moment that it adds one element to that empty list, it sums the result zero with uh, the last element. Then it sums the previous to last element to the last element. Then it sums the third element from the end with the sum of the previous two elements and so on. Basically, it reduces uh, an operation over a list of elements, a recursion over a list of elements to basically the base case at the end and then folding in every single element to the right, basically from the end to the beginning. So now we can apply the sum list on a list of integers one, two, three, and basically the result is six. So this is a standard case of recursion over a list with a binary operator, with a binary function. So this reduce uh, fold R also has an equivalent fold L, fold to the left. So again, this is actually a similar function. It takes, uh, it's a fold operation that takes a function on a pair of two elements, usually are of the same type, but not necessarily with results in another, uh, in the type of the second element. An accumulator, because we are folding left from the beginning, we put the result from the beginning up to the current position into an accumulator. Fold R didn't need this accumulator. Basically you were obtaining the results for partial functions and then you would get the result for the whole function. But if you start from the beginning, you need something to keep the result in like for instance, an accumulator variable. And then we have the, the list that is passed as a parameter. And fold L basically starts with, if the, if the uh, result, if L is equal with uh, the empty list, then we return the accumulator. Basically we reached in fact the end and then you, re you return the accumulator that was accumulated from the beginning. Other, otherwise, uh, the result of fold L is fold L of the same function, 
the function applied to it's also a binary function the function applied to the head of the list and the accumulator and then the tail of the list so basically it takes elements from the last parameter the third parameter and moves them to the accumulator using that function f that we saw before so the same sum function that takes a list of integers and computes the sum can be actually implemented with fold L as follows. It's a fold L with an anonymous function that takes any X and the accumulator and computes the sum of X with the accumulator. Zero as the accumulator at first step when the list is right at the beginning and no elements were considered. And then uh, the list of integers. So the same sum basically sums in the same way, only that it starts from the beginning. So for the first element, uh, basically it does the sum of uh, the first element with accumulator zero and calls the same function fold L recursively with the same function, the accumulator and the tail of the list. So again, applied to the to the our example is basically the uh, the sum of one plus two plus three is six. It works the, the list from the from left to the right as opposed to fold R that work the list from right to the left, okay? So these are two examples of higher order functions. One is iterate from the end to the beginning and the other one is iterate from the beginning to the end. Another example of using uh, functional programming is numerical integration. So all of you, I would assume that know from calculus that the uh, integral from an inter for an interval that starts with A to an uh, end of the interval B uh, is basically computed as the area under that function, if it's a positive function, okay? So basically, how do we approximate uh, this value by using some number of intervals. We divide equally that area, and then we basically compute the area of this uh, trapezoid that basically gives us what's basically the area under that function uh, approximately. So basically what we want is a similar function, but uh, given any function like cube function, which basically you know the cube function is very highly uh, it's a polynomial function, but where it grows very fast, I would like to find out what's the, uh, the area the integral over the cube function in the interval from zero to 10 with a step of two. So basically it approximates with a step of two, this function. So basically this is uh, quite straightforward. If the integrate takes a function, a higher, it's a higher level function, takes a function as a parameter, takes the interval a and b and the number of partitions n. If n is less than zero or b is less than a, then it returns zero. Basically the integral is zero. We don't compute for negative n uh, number of interval intervals or if uh, the interval is not increasing. Otherwise, we basically compute the area of that tra uh, trapezoid, that polygon that we have there, which is basically the height of the polygon, which is actually uh, the distance A plus B divided by N, that's the height of the polygon, multiplied with F of A plus F of A plus H, the two values of uh, F of uh, uh, of the value a and a plus h divided by two. And that gives us exactly that area that we have there. So in our, this case is basically the value of the height, which is b minus a divided by n multiplied with f of a plus f of a plus h divided by two. Plus we integrate over the rest of the interval. So instead of a, we have a plus b minus a divided by n up to uh, b with a number of steps n minus one, because we basically already consider one step. And if you want to actually see what's the integral over the cube function, which is x multiplied with x multiplied with x, basically you call integrate of cube from zero to 10 with a step of two. And it's approximately 4.04. .04. So that's how you do integration or basically approximation of integration 
uh, with functional programming. Another example, if you remember in Java, we actually in Java uh, streams, when we talked about collections, one of the functions that we had there was a function called collect. And collect is also a general recursive function. And it's very similar to fold R and fold uh, L that we saw before. So again, it basically uh, uh, takes the base case as a parameter, a combine function and an accept function and the list of elements, okay? So in the case that uh, the list is uh, nil, is empty, it returns accept of the base case. So it basically executes this accept function on the base case, on the base value. If the list is not empty, if it has an h element and a tail t, then collect of the base case, combine, accept, and that list is actually equal with collect of combine of the base case with the head of the list, then the same combine function and accept function and the tail of the list. So basically it combines this base case with every single element that we have and that becomes the current accumulator, the current base case. And similar to what we did in uh, Java collections, you can compute the average using this uh, function. So for instance, the average, it's a collect. The base case is zero, zero. Basically it's a pair, a tuple, where the first argument is the sum of the elements in the list. And the second argument is the count of how many elements are in the list. So the base case starts with zero, zero. Then the function for combining is a function that takes this pair of total and count and the current element x and it increments the total it all the result of the fun this function is also a pair where the total is total plus x the count is incremented with one the function for acceptance is basically that i take the total and the count and i return the division between the total as a real and the count as a real so basically it computes the average and it takes the list. So again, the way that average works is that it calls collect with the combined function that for every element, it actually computes the new sum and it increments the count with one. The accept function as a function that actually computes the average for the sum and the count. So it divides just the total with the count. And the base case is the pair zero zero because basically we need to count the elements and we need to sum their value in order to compute the average. And exactly like in the previous case, average of uh, an integer array, in this case it could also take a real array, is basically uh, the average. It uh, uses the collect function to compute the sum, the total and uh, the count, and then it divides the two to compute the average. So this collect function, we also saw it when we actually had Java streams. We basically had a collect as a final operation, as a general operation in, uh, uh, in uh, streams to combine all of the elements in the collection and execute an accept function at the end. So now you can basically see how this works. And one thing that I haven't done, uh, usually my code works as is. So let me actually show it to you in uh, SML. So this is the fold R uh, or reduce. So now the sum function basically uses this reduce operation to sum list from the end. And let's pass as the list one, two, three. So basically it uses reduce with the plus operation as the combination function, zero as the base case and the list. Then fold L does exactly the same, but with an accumulator. So it starts from the beginning with zero, for instance, for computing the sum. And uh, the folding operation being adding X 
to the accumulator. So now the same function would basically take an array and sum its values. Okay. Then we did the integration, numerical integration. So it's basically integration with an approximation. Uh, this H is actually wrong. This is supposed to be this. Let me actually clean up a little bit the code. Okay. Save it. Uh, yeah, now it should have worked unless I didn't uh, close all the parentheses. So let me take a look one more time. We have parentheses open here. Here we compute the value of H that is completed. Then we compute F of A plus F of A plus B divided by N. So this is an end of that open parenthesis in F. This is the end of this parenthesis. I believe this is one parenthesis too many, unless we have one more parenthesis here. Okay, so let's see if this works now. If not, we we'll basically need to put more parenthesis at some point. Yeah, so that is correct. And now we can use the function cube as an example. And we can compute integrate of cube over from zero with a step of two up to 10. But because it's uh, a carrying function, a partially defined function, We'll basically have to define it this way. I think they have to be real numbers, Professor. I think you are right. Because that's why it's. As opposed to other languages, you actually have to put zero. Does it matter? Oh. There is no difference. Oh, okay, that was it. That was actually the only difference. You're right. You are, you are completely right. Okay, good. And then we have the collect function. and the average that uses both combine and accept. And now we can basically do average. And it worked. Okay. Okay, another example, mutually recursive functions. So one problem about SM ML, and actually probably is the time to do the lab for the day, is the fact that uh, in SML, if you have double recursive functions, like odd calls even and even calls odd, uh, you basically will have to uh, define both into the same block. So basically what the problem is, is the following, that if you define any previous, uh, every function has to be defined using functions that were defined before, okay? So let me actually do the lab and then we can return back to the lecture and I will explain through the lab what was the problem there. So the first problem in the lab, and let me just copy the two problems into a text file. 
is summing the pairs into all list. So write an SML function that takes a list of integers and the function takes any pair of elements, adds them and inserts them into the result. If the original list has an odd length, then the last element is just put in the result as is. So basically we'll need a function, some pairs, which takes a list of elements. And first of all, we need the base cases. So if the list is empty, then return empty. There is nothing else. Else, if the tail of the list is empty, then I can't sum anything else. So then also return the list else. And in fact, I can consolidate these two cases, the first base case and the second one, because the list is empty in the first case. So, or else, if the tail is empty, just return the list. Else, sum the head of the list with the head of the tail of the list and put it at the beginning of the result of some pairs. And now we have to remove two elements from the list, the tail of the tail of the list. So let's try it. Uh, or else did not work, it's not of the type bool. So, okay if the tail of the list is empty. This time it worked fine. And now we can basically run our two examples. So the first example returns 10 because eight plus two is 10, three plus one is four and five plus four is nine. And the same example, if we add a seven at the end, like we have in the lab, it basically the last element is added without having to be summed with anything else. So basically this is the definition of that function and how it works. The second function, write an SML uh, function group duplicates that takes a list of integers as its only argument and the function takes runs of values, consecutive duplicated values and puts them into separate lists. So it takes a list of integers and groups the duplicates, like three fours, one, two, two threes, four sevens, one, two, one, three, and three fours. So basically we need a function group duplicates. So the function group duplicates takes a list. Again, we have a base case if the list is empty, then it returns empty. There is nothing else to group. Otherwise, uh, we need to group the duplicates in the prefix. So let's do a function prefix. We'll have to define it earlier, function prefix. So what does this function take? It should take one element, which is the head of the list. Um, It should take the rest of the, uh, it should take the accumulator, which is basically, uh, we can actually use the reduce function, but let's write it first. So it takes the prefix, then the, the same prefix, but in a list as the current element. Although I could, no, we could add it uh, in this list as a prefix. Then it takes the rest of the elements. And it groups all of the prefix elements at the beginning. Then it puts this at the beginning of the result of group duplicates. And then we have to remove that prefix, the head of the list, remove prefix where the head of the list from the tail of the list. Okay, 
So let's see if this we can implement this. So first of all, the prefix function takes an element, an accumulator, and a list. If the list is empty, then it returns accumulator. Else, if the list, if the head of the list is the same with the element E, then it calls recursively prefix of the same element, the accumulator becomes E cons the previous accumulator and the tail of the list L. And now the remove function is also recursive. Actually, we need an else in this case, else the accumulator, because basically it means that there are no more elements that are equal with E. Remove prefix takes an element and a list. And again, it has a base case. If the list is empty, then empty. Else, if the head of the list is equal with element E, then continue removing that prefix E from the tail of the list. Else, return the list L, because basically it means that the head of L is not E. So let's see if this works. So the prefix, it works. The removing the prefix, it also works. And grouping the duplicates, it also works. So now we can basically test it. So what does it return for this list? It, it uh, grouped the duplicates into sublists. So one thing that we need to do here is that uh, I've wrote first the last function that basically finds the prefix that is with uh, same element. And then I uh, implemented the functions prefix and remove prefix. So basically the idea is that although the way that I program is that I write first the main method kind of uh, function and then the used functions, the helper functions, I basically uh, have to have those predefined in order for the main function to actually be well-defined. So this is exactly the case for uh, when we basically have mutually defined functions. So odd of n, if n is zero, then it's false, it's not odd. Else odd of n is true if even of n minus one is true but even was not yet defined. So even of n is defined in the same statement. Even of n, if n is zero, then it's true. Else, even of n is similar, is equivalent with odd of n minus one. And you can define both functions because each one defines the other one and you can define e either one first. If you try to define one of them first without having to define both of them at the same time, you basically, it will tell you, you can't do that because even is not yet defined. And if you try the other one, it will tell you that, no, you can't do that either because odd is not defined. So really the question is, how do you define two functions that are mutually recursive? One is dependent on the other one, while the other one is dependent on the first one. You can do that with the operator n, and. The operator and allows you to basically define multiple functions into one single statement. And it basically gives you that the result of this is actually two different functions. It's still similar to the command prompt that you write a statement and it gives you the result, only that in this case, the result is multiple functions. And in fact, you can define as many as you want, as long as they are not dependent on something that appears later, okay? So that's basically it. Now you can basically write things like uh, 
even of one or odd of one. So basically, even of one is true if odd of zero is true, and that's false. And odd of one is true if even of zero is true, and that's true. So basically, it goes down and then it returns back and tells you the result. And actually, I'm using it for implementing merge sort. So most of you uh, remember, all of you remember this semester we did sorting functions. And one of them was merging merge sort. It was invented by von Neumann in 1950. And basically, the idea is that in order to sort a list L of uh, elements, first you split the list L into two equal sublists. You sort those. And then you sort the two merged lists and you sort this recursively. You sort the sublist recursively, then you finally merge the sorted list in linear time. It requires suitable functions for splitting the list into two equal sublists. And the best way to split the list into two equal sublists is actually to take the first element in one list, the other one in the other list then the next element in the first list and the next element in the second list and so on. So basically you need two mutually uh, uh, recursive lists. One that takes the, the odd indexed element and one that skips the odd indexed element. And that basically takes us to these functions, take and skip. So take and skip are basically two functions that are mutually recursive. One of them take takes every odd numbered element positions. The skip list takes every even numbered element position. And they are mutually recursive. So basically, how do they work? Take of L is equal with if the list is empty, then it's empty. Else, it takes the head of the list and cons it to the result of skip of the tail of the list. So one thing I did here, instead of calling take again on the tail of the tail of the list, I'm calling skip because I don't know if the list doesn't have, the tail is not empty. So instead of doing an extra check, I'm going to just call skip on the tail of the list. And that will skip the next element and take the following element. Similarly, I implement skip, but skip actually uses take internally. So if the list is empty, then it returns empty. Else it calls take of the tail of the list. So instead of taking the first element like take did, it takes the second element. We skip the first element due to the tail of the list and we take the next element, which is the second element. So take and skip are defined into one single statement. And basically you pass in a list and Res, uh, results into half the odd numbered elements or the even numbered elements. And here I have two examples. If you take from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, basically it takes one, three, five, and seven. If you skip over the same list, it returns the even elements, two, four, and six. Okay. So let me actually show you these two examples. So take and skip are defined mutually recursive. And if we invoke take on a list of integers, basically it, it takes the first element, it calls skip on the rest of the list, skip skips two and returns uh, take of the tail of that list, which returns three and calls skip on the list that starts with four and so on. That's why you get the even numbered elements. And now if we call skip of the same list, basically it takes the even elements, two, four, and six. So now you can basically see how the sorting actually works. So basically you invoke take and skip, and then you need a function for merging two sorted lists. So first of all, you need the base cases. Merging the empty list with a list is the second list. Merging the first list with the empty list is the first list. Other than that, you are merging two lists that contain at least one element in each. So you compare the, uh, that first element from the first list with the first element from the second list. If X is smaller, 
then the result of merging those two lists is x cons merge of the tail of the first list and the second list. Else is y, the first element in the second list, cons the result of merge of the first list and the tail of the second list. So basically what this does, it merges two sorted lists. If you now pass in the sorted lists, it basically finds which one is minimum from the first two elements, the first element in each list, keeps the minimum and then calls merge of the rest of the list and the other list. So that's exactly what we are going to do for sorting. So merge, basically, you can call merge on two lists. So the first list, let's say that it contains one, two, three, six, eight, and nine. The second list is four, five, four, five, then we have seven and maybe 10. And the two lists merged, sorted, merged is basically the list of all the integers from one to 10. And finally, we have the actual merge sort method. So sorting a list, if the list is empty or if the tail of the list is empty, it returns that list because basically there is nothing else to sort. Otherwise, uh, it calls merge of sort of take of L and sort of skip of L. So it basically calls merge, the sorted merge with half of the list, the even, the odd elements, odd indexed elements with the even indexed elements. So that basically is how this is done. And in fact, I can even optimize it a little bit or else if the tail is empty, return just the current list. So this is basically a more straightforward implementation. So now sort of, let's say, Five, three, six, two, one, nine. It basically returns the sorted list. One, two, three, five, six, nine. Okay. That's that's basically how this works. Let me actually add an example here. So when I update the, the lectures, you can actually see how this worked. Okay. Now, one thing that I basically did in a couple of examples, like for instance, uh, take and skip can be implemented into, into a single method because you don't, a single function, because you can return tuples in uh, uh, functional programming, SML in particular. So one thing that you can do and optimize a little bit the program, so you don't need to call take and then you don't separately you call skip is to actually use local decay declarations is not purely functional. So most functional programming people will actually tell you not to use local declarations, although they basically have a little bit of uh, optimization. You only compute everything once. You don't rely on the compiler or the interpreter to do tabling for you, uh, memoization, remembering the values for functions that you already called before, so they are not uh, recomputed. So local declarations is when you actually call another function. So let's say that you want to simplify a fraction. You have 10 over five, but you know that 10 over five is actually two. So you want to find the greatest common divider between the numerator and the de denominator. And then you want to divide both the numerator and the denominator with that greatest common divider. But you don't want to put this greatest common divider between n and d both here and here, because basically you are redoing that call. So what you can do is to use a local declaration, a local variable k that is equal with the GCD of n and d in the expression that you actually want to compute. Now, one thing about SML is that you actually don't have blocks. So you actually have to put in and an end 
where that block actually ends. So this local identifier K is local to this uh, block that starts with in and ends with end. Its binding only exists during the evaluation of this expression and all other declarations of K are hidden in this expression. If you have another K defined as a value in the interpreter, that K is not accessible. Okay. So it's just a local declaration, declaration of this variable. So you can basically reuse it, uh, but we need to implement the greatest common divider. So basically let's do a greatest common divider. In fact, why don't I actually put it here? So let's say that we did have a function greatest common divider. So the function greatest common divider between n and m is equal with if m and n are the same then it's equal with n itself oops else the greatest common divider we first have to see which one is bigger so we check if n is greater than m if it's true then it's equal with the greatest common divider between m and n minus m else we can actually directly consider that m is greater than n so else is the greatest common divider between n and m minus n so now we can basically compute this fraction that we started so we have the greatest common divider with the uh, euclidean method and then we have this single call for the greatest common divider for simplifying a fraction so now we can have a fraction of how much is 10 divided with 25 or basically simplified with 25 and it should be 2 over 3 or 2 over 5 sorry because it's 2 multiplied with 5 and 5 multiplied with 5 so let me also add this example here. Maybe I can add it at the end. So fraction of 10 and 25 is this fraction. Okay, that's a local declaration. So I think you may have mentioned it earlier, but is the keyword in for the function fraction what returns the tuple? Yeah, so I didn't actually mention it. So basically the idea here is that you define a local variable, then you have to, you, you're basically defining like you have everything in uh, SML is an expression. So this in basically now just says, this is a local variable available in this expression. And the expression is the expression that you would evaluate for the function, because you see, you don't have explicit returns. Everything is like after the then or after the else is supposed to be an expression that will be individually uh, evaluated. So the only difference when you define a local variable is that uh, you this in states that from now on I'm starting the expression that will be evaluated for being returned by that function. So this keyword in and end is just so you can define multiple local variables one after another and then state and from now on I go back to computing the expression for that function. So if you technically wanted to have the fraction like it wouldn't be called the fraction, but if you wanted it to return like the fraction and the least common multiple, just as some random example, you could use yeah. another local variable and then another in and end block. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, sorting with comparison. So before we actually, so now we are getting into the SML, more SML uh, material. So until now it was really, we, we talked about pure functional programming. We talked about how do you solve a problem uh, with functional programming, especially for lists. Then we talked about higher order functions, but now we are getting into the fact that SML is actually a fully, uh, a full language. You can basically do uh, over overwriting and you can actually check the order of comparisons and el sort elements of any type. So it's really, these are details. And in fact, it's really just for you. I will not ask questions like, like this one that if you don't have the type of the element, how do you actually invoke to find out the type? So basically what this defines is the fact that you have a sort order and in this sort order, uh, the sort order for an empty list is the empty list. For a single element in a list is just that single element. Other than that, you have sort takes the order function and the list of elements. Then I define the merge function exactly as I had it before, empty list with M is M, L with empty list is L. Otherwise merging a list L, S, X, cons, XS basically says that the first list is a list that contains the head X and the tail XS. And the second list is a list that contains the, uh, the head Y and the tail YS. If the order between X and Y is positive, like it's increasing, X is less than Y. So this is just order is just a Boolean function. Nothing else is a function that takes two elements of any type A and returns true. Then uh, it basically returns X cons merge between X as the tail of the first list and the second list else it returns the first element of the second list cons merge between the first entire list and the tail of that list. So really the, the, the only thing that is extra here is to the, the fact that the comparison function is, is, part, is passed as a parameter. Everything else, now it's basically, we let that function be defined within this outer function so we have a local function to the current function. Then we split the, uh, we, we split the list XS into the even elements and the odd elements. This is a split function that basically works in especially ex exactly the same way that our take and skip worked. That basically takes a list and it puts the first element in the first list and uh, the second element in the second list and then the next element in the first list and the next element in the second list and so on. And then we have the sort operation. So basically the result is merge between sort or with the same order of the first half with sort with the same order with the second half and the end of that expression. So the only thing that is not defined here is the split function. And we can actually define it ourselves. So let me try to define the split function. I should probably keep the lab so I can post it on Piazza after the class, but split. So split takes a list. Now, if the list is empty, then it returns a pair of two empty lists. Else, it means that it contains an element in the first list. So basically we should start populating the two lists, but let's try to do it with let. So let, uh, the pair left and right, actually I can't use L again, L1 and L2 equal, basically we need to uh, let 
this to uh, val let's actually call it that way val l1 l2 is equal with split of the tail of the list l in and now we take the head of the list and we put it in the first list the head of l cons l1 actually i should have also taken the tail okay we'll do that way so we need another case else if actually if the list is either empty or the tail of the list is empty in either case the first list is the list l and the second list is empty then we compute the pair l1 l2 by splitting the tail of the tail of the list l and then we put the head of l into the first list l1 and the head of the tail of the list l into the second list l2 and okay so let's see if this works i have a syntax error with the number of parentheses so i have to see where we have some issue with parentheses we don't have any issues with parentheses Hmm. I will try to fix it after the class. I can't see that I know why split does not work. I think it's because you used or, not or else. Oh, yeah, right. That's one case, but well, let's see if that was the reason. Not only. So that's that was one issue. So now it uh, it's still an error somewhere. But even the first statement, why is this wrong? If L is empty or the tail of L is empty, then return the pair. Ah, fun. I mean, we are defining a function. It worked. So now let's call it split of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it returns a split of the two lists. Yeah, thank you very much. We fixed it. So now sorting with comparison basically needs this split, which in fact I had it on the next slide. I just didn't want to just use it from there. I just wanted to define it myself. So let me actually show the, the definition of split here. So split here is actually using two functions, split helper, which takes a list and an accumulator. If the list is empty, then it returns the accumulator, else it calls the split helper of the tail of the list. And in this accumulator, uh, the, the second argument uh, of the accumulator is basically flipped at the beginning and the second argument is the head of the list cons the, set, the first argument. So basically it calls 
with a pair of empty empty and then it flips and puts the first element in each one of the lists. An alternative is the one that we found with wrote. So basically, let me add, let me create a copy and an alternative to split this split is the one that we actually brought together. And this one only, this does basically the same thing, but it does it uh, into with let, with uh, the local variable. Okay. Another example of sorting, quick sort. So earlier this semester, we learned quick sort, which has an average running time of n log n. The worst running time is still uh, quadratic, but average running time, uh, it basically splits the elements based on a, the first element as a pivot. So this sort takes a list. And again, it returns the empty list if it's uh, the empty list. Otherwise, takes uh, a list with a head x and the tail xs. The value is the split of uh, lower elements and bigger elements or smaller and bigger. And that's the result of partition of x with uh, xs. So basically, based on the pivot x, it splits the tail xs into smaller and bigger. And then the sort, the quick sort is concatenation of the sort of the smaller elements with x cons the sort of the bigger elements. How does uh, basically the partition works? It's with double recursion and no tail recursion. So what is that? The function partition takes an element and the list. If the list is empty, it, it has a pair of two empty lists. Otherwise, uh, partition of the, of, uh, with the pivot P and the head X and the tail XS, we let S B be the pair returned by partition of the tail. If X is less than the element P, then we return uh, X in the uh, smaller elements, else we return X in the bigger elements. We still return a pair of the smaller and the bigger elements. So basically this is the partition method. Now, one other example of recursion that we talked, uh, we didn't, we talked last semester when we did recursion was the Ackermann function. The Ackermann function is defined as follows. It has two parameters. If the first parameter is zero, then the result of the Ackermann function is n plus one, the second parameter plus one. If the second parameter is zero, then the Ackermann of n and zero is Ackermann of n minus one and one. Ackermann of m and n and m is Ackermann of n minus one uh, and, uh, and Ackermann of n and m minus one. So basically there is a direct translation of this with uh, patterns. Ackermann of zero m is m plus one. Ackermann of n and zero is Ackermann of n minus one and one, and Ackermann of n and m, the first pattern will be the one that matches, is Ackermann of n minus one and Ackermann of n and m minus one. One thing to be very careful about this is that it grows extremely fast. So for instance, Ackermann of uh, uh, five and five is a huge value, which you can't compute, basically it's, more than the uh, elements in the universe. It's guaranteed to end because the, uh, of lexicographical order, but it's a very highly uh, recursive function. It returns results only for the first few elements. Afterwards, it's too big to actually be computed. Another example of nested recursion is what is called the Nudes up arrow operator invented by Donald Knuth. So A up arrow B is A to the power B. A up arrow one uh, uh, N B is A up arrow N minus one of B up arrow N minus one with B. So basically the Knuth operator is takes as parameters the power and then the two operands A and B. So it's really straightforward. 
oper uh, node operator of one A and B is uh, A to the power B. Node operator of N A and B is node operator of N minus one and A. And the result of node operator of N minus one B and B. So you can pass operands like uh, integers for the value of N and then the two values and it basically returns these values. It's also very fast, uh, highly uh, gross, extremely high because basically, uh, as you can basically see, uh, node operator of three, three and three is overflow. And actually node operator of 63, three and three it's a big number called Graham number, which is a very large integer. Okay, another example of recursion in SML. Let me see how we do with time. Pretty good, 5.30. Uh, it's a recursion as a generalized problem. So we talked about those problems, uh, fold R and fold L, L uh, and collection, collect and reduce. So basically it's, it's a, a problem of how do you generalize recursion? Uh, so the following question is a question in, a, in applied math. Is it, is it impossible to determine whether N is prime via replying to the question is N minus one prime? And the reason is that it seems impossible to directly construct a recursive program. So uh, you can get that some big N is prime but does that mean that n plus one, the next element is prime or not? We thus find, try to find another function that is more general than prime in the sense that prime is a particular case of this function for which a recursive program can be constructed. So n divisors takes n low and up. So it takes basically a number and an interval low and up low is greater than up or else n modulo low is different than zero and also the n divisors of n and low plus one and up is true so basically this is a function that defines uh, a boolean function it takes a range it takes an n and it returns uh, uh, true if low is greater than up or that conjunction is true that either n modulo uh, the remainder of n division with low is different than zero or n divisors of n low plus one and up is true and also so basically both of them have to be true uh, or low should be greater than up and then we can define prime as follows prime of n is true if n is less than zero then is not a positive argument, we are not going to consider it. Else, if n is z1 is false, else we ask, are there actually any divisors? Is n net divisors going to return true for prime for n up to the, uh, two, from two to the floor of square root of real n? So basically the idea is that we are trying to find if n has any divisors from two to the value of uh, this uh, upper bound. The discovery of these divisors, basically, if you actually want to guess the divisors without having to compute them all in that interval, which is uh, in fact, basically brute force of trying to find if N is prime, is it's quite a hard problem. Now, another issue that appears with SML and functional programming in general is tail recursion. So the function length, if you look at it, is basically it gives you if the, the was the length of the list in the size of the list. So for the empty list is equal with zero. Otherwise, the length of the list is of a list that starts with the head and the tail is one plus the length of the tail. Now, we don't expect length to basically compute a deep stack in the size of the, the list. So this inner length is nested inside an expression, one plus the length of excess. 
So during the evaluation, you have to basically remember one, n times as the length of this list. You have to store all the terms of the sum, one plus one plus one plus one, and you're consuming basically stack and memory. So basically you will have one for every element. So how can we compute it such a length in a better way, a, a way in which you can reuse the same uh, 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 record in the stack? So one way is to actually use a helper function called an accumulator. So length auxiliary takes the list and an accumulator. If the list is empty, it returns the accumulator. Otherwise, the length auxiliary uh, of the list that contains at least an element X and the tail XS and the accumulator is length auxiliary between the tail of the list and the accumulator plus one. The advantage now is that you actually, for every element, you actually put the size in that accumulator. So you don't remember, basically, you don't have to consider the sizes of these elements up up to when you get to that accumulate, uh, when to, uh, you get to the result. So the advantage is that you can actually, re when you call the function auxiliary, you can actually reuse the current frame. You just have to initialize the first argument to the tail of the list and the second argument to the new accumulator. And this is what is called tail recursion. When the recursive call is the out most operation, then the space is constant because you can actually reuse the same activation record or frame on the stack as you basically had for the current function. So the time complexity for uh, computing the length is still the same. You need a traversal of the list, but the space complexity is unit time, is unit because you can reuse the same space. And this is a common optimization for any compiler, not only functional programming, but mainly functional programming. You basically don't reuse, uh, you reuse space. You don't create new frames for every single recursive call because you can reuse the frame of the current call. So this auxiliary uh, can be actually used for other functions. Like for instance, you want to compute factorial of uh, some number. Again, factorial of n is, you call factorial auxiliary of n and one. And now factorial auxiliary for zero is just returns the accumulator. For any other n, it calls factorial auxiliary between n minus one and n multiplied with accumulator. So basically, when a tail recursive function is a function that in every recursive case, it doesn't have actually have other, other outside expressions. Everything is transformed into an inside expression that it's immediately computed. And then it basically calls a recursive call on the same function as we had in the outer function. That's in a common optimization called tail recursion. Uh, SML also has objects or what you basically call uh, dictionaries. So you can actually create, a, you can create a record. Curly braces are to actually create these records or dictionaries. Like for instance, make Toyota model Corolla year 2017 color silver. Uh, the order doesn't matter. This is equal with model Corolla make Toyota color silver year 2017, and it's true. Uh, you can also extract and use concatenation, for instance, the full name out of the first name and the last name, age and balance is the first concatenated with space, concatenated with last name. So it's basically just a way to have objects in SML. Uh, some other languages based on, on uh, uh, ML, like OCaml, are expanding it to creating classes. But these are simple records. Strings can be concatenated, and you can do string operations. Like, for instance, uh, uh, you can extract 
from a single string that has a single character, an object of the type, type car. You can explode the string into the character into a list of characters. You can implode the list of characters into a string. You can concatenate strings with a hat sign, and you can find the size of a string. You can check if uh, uh, you can extract a substring, which is a sub character, in fact, from a string at the position two, is one based. So you can actually see that actually is zero based, sorry. Uh, two is stands for C. You can extract an entire substring from position three, four characters. Uh, you can also do concatenation by passing a, uh, a list of uh, strings to a, a concat function, and you can translate a character into a string. Functional programming that we cover today uh, in these lectures were uh, reduction of expressions, recursion, polymorphism uh, via type variables, strong typing in SML, type inference, pattern matching, high order functions, and tail recursion. Beyond functional programming, there are other programming logic uh, paradigms, like for instance, relational programming or logic programming. And the advantage of logic programming, the main advantage is the fact that you can basically pass any variable, any argument as a variable. So you can append, let's say, the list one, two, with three and get one, two, three. But you can also ask what can be appended to one, two to get one, two, three. And in this case, x will be solved, the second argument to three. Similarly, you can ask what two lists can be concatenated together into the list one, two, three. And basically that will give you all the possibilities of such list, empty list with one, two, three, or one with two, three, or one, two with three, or one, two, three with empty. So basically the advantage of logic programming is that it internally it uses resolution or theorem proving to actually uh, prove this statement and all the arguments could be variables unbound or bound to actual values. And in fact, let me actually show you how this works. So I'm going to create a new file. So I'm going to write append in prolog, appending the empty list with the list L is the list L and then appending a list that contains a head and a tail with another list L is a list that contains the head and the tail. Let's call it T2. If append of the tail T with L is T2. So we save this into a file. I'm going to save it on the desktop. Let's call it um, prolog1.pl. And I'm going to use the Stony Brook prolog system XSB. Uh, maybe I will use SWI prolog because basically XSB looks like I don't have it on this machine. So I want to compile that file that we saw before. So prolog1.pl and now we can call append of a list one, two with three is what? And it says is one, two, three. But in the same time, you can basically say what list do we want to append with one, two to get the list one, two, three. Moreover, you can even say what two lists L and R can you append to get one, two, three? And it gives you all the possibilities. It says that it could be that the empty list with one, two, three, or one with two, three, or one, two with three, or one, two, three with empty. So this basically this append works uh, as uh, a, a, a theorem proving mechanism. 
in fact let me actually put the code here there are, it's only three lines of code so really be, be, beyond functional programming there is logic programming and the way that it works is that it actually backtracks it tries every possibility uh, every rule from the beginning to the end and if one of them fails it goes to the next rule it also uses internally a mechanism called unification that it has two structures and tries to unify them two structures unify if they have either the same value or they have the same functor symbol and the same parameters uh, you compare corresponding parameters first with first second with second the function symbols also has to have the same number of parameters. But I will not go into logic programming and other type of programming. Another type of programming is called constraint programming. So constraint programming is very similar, very close, in fact, to uh, linear equations. That you are given a set of variables, each variable has a set of domains. And then you are getting constraints, like for instance, 3x plus 4x2 is less than x4. And you are asked, give me, a, give me the solution for all of these equations. And you can do it basically either like in Prolog that you try all possible values from every, every domain. Another way is to actually constrict the domain, annotate the variables with attributes with the domain that is restricted if you give some other value for the other attributes. So really, there are different objectives. You can find one solution, multiple solutions, or an optimal solution. Like in integer programming, you may actually have a optimization function, function like minimize the number of uh, stock that you use. Uh, you can also implement other problems with constraint programming. Like, for instance, an example of constraint programming is the n queens problem. You say that the variables, each one has a value for the uh, 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 row for the column number. So basically, you have from one to n for every variable. Every variable is for one queen on one row, and then you give the constraints that can there cannot be two uh, queens in the same row or two queens on the same diagonal. And then a constraint logic programming system will actually exhaustively try all the possible solutions, test the constraints for every single possibility. An optimization is that instead of trying all the possible solutions, puts the queen at the first position and then reduces the domain for the other queens. The moment that one queen doesn't have any possible value, it backtracks and the previous queen is moved to the next position. And it has applications in scheduling, planning, transportation, standard problems like the stock problem, uh, when you get basically, let's say, pipes of the same uh, uh, size and you get a set of uh, uh, sizes for the pipes, let's say that you are a plumber. And then you want to minimize the number of uh, pipes that you want to use uh, because you can cut in different ways these pipes. And these are basically standard constraint solving problems. And you can basically use uh, constraint programming or logic programming to solve them. Usually these problems are all NP complete, but there are, uh, or exponential complexity, but there are optimizations or basically heuristics to solve each one of them. But the topic for the final exam will be just functional programming. And I will basically uh, go over a sample exam next class, our last class for the semester. That's all for today. Thank you very much. And I will post the, uh, the recording as soon as uh, it's available.